I love this gun. Here's another World War II era combat firearm that's got soul. Walnut, steel, battle hardened, for that matter, Hollywood hardened, soul. I connect to it. It is one of my all time favorite semi automatic recreational firearms. The M1 carbine. And we go back a bit, all the way to 1976. Man, time has flown. Back then, I was doing Saturday afternoon outings with my buddy, Creed Walton, and he had a Universal brand M1 carbine. Obviously not a World War II, genuine World War II era firearm. It's a reproduction. But man, did that thing shoot, and man, was it fun. And it was my first introduction to a high firepower weapon of this sort. And I loved it. I was impressionable. We shot bullfrogs with it. We shot chunks of wood in the gravel pits in Hampton, Virginia with it. What a rush, man. We didn't have a lot of money back then, so and then we didn't shoot it like all day long. We had to resort to 22s. But I remember it. And it burned into my memory banks. The M1 Carbine. Welcome to the Nut and Fancy Project. Probably a feature length review on this wonderful firearm. I'll do the best I can to represent aspects of it that are important to me. There's no way I'm going to cover all its history, its controversies, its developmental changes. Your, no, your not going to do that. I'll just, just don't hit here and there. Right Talk about our shooting experience over a span of freak, what's it been? two years with this gun in the Nut and Fancy project. And I will focus on philosophy of use, which is really interesting for the M1 carbine. Very interesting. And I'll start out by saying that as long as your philosophy of use, your POU, is grounded with the M1 carbine, your expectations are realistic. On my likability scale, a good to outstanding World War II, even Korean example, 10 out of 10. That's how much I like the gun. With a caveat on the POU, that you realize that in the modern era, there are combat arms that will just dominate this in terms of firepower, accuracy, range, stopping power. I think most guys dialing into this video will know this. If you haven't subbed already, sub now. Upper left, TMP support the work, the expense of TMP to bring you videos like this. I said Hollywood, by the way, in the intro, and I think that's appropriate because a lot of us have grown up seeing this gun used in a number of World War II movies, Korean era, well, not era, but Korean topic movies of the Korean War, and that to our generation and to actually current generations playing video games perhaps, it's still an influential gun. Band of Brothers, Saving Private Ryan, The Longest Day all come to mind. What an awesome Hollywood gun it is. But I think at the same time, it's representative of its actual use in combat. And of course, this gun was conceived as a replacement for the pistol to secondary troops, mortar crewmen, engineers, NCOs, people who cannot or could not carry around an M1 Garand, combat engineers, rimps of all varieties. You get the picture. In that role in World War II, when this gun was fielded, as you well know, it excelled at that role. As And I think it still does. When compared against the pistol, the M1 carbine is the you know, our first PCC, really. It's not really a pistol caliber carbine, but the power level of the 30 carbine cartridge, in my way of thinking, is on par with that. It's not a super powerful firearm. We will talk about this more. But in World War II, it caught on like wildfire. The troops loved this gun, even frontline troops who it was not intended for. Why? Because, let's just say it right now, it's extremely portable. Can you imagine back then all the heavy guns, the bolt-action rifles? The Grand is no lightweight. 
By the way, the M1 Grand, go watch my review. I just rave about that gun. It's right up there. These two guns in my likability scale, neck and neck. They're tens across the board. But you're hefting a grand and then you pick up a five point or uh, well five pound ten ounce and that's with a fifteen round magazine and sling as you see there on the table. And it's five pounds ten ounces. It's like half the weight almost of a grand. And it's reliable. Yeah, they loved it. It was a huge success. Now, if you're interested, you can dig into the history of the M1 carbine. There's a lot of great books on it. Uh, I did get one and was kind of flipping through it and reading it. This is excellent. This is Bruce Canfield's complete guide to the Grand and the M1 carbine. Highly recommended read. There's a lot more, a lot of online resources. Carbine Williams is a movie that was made, giving like most of the credit for the design to Williams, when in fact, all he did was the piston design, I believe. It was a team effort. I'm not going to talk too much about that. What resulted, though, was a fascinating, enduring piece of engineering that even to this day, it stands as a viable and effective firearm. As, as much as it was in World War II. To me, that's fascinating. The M1 Grand's no different. That here, under the gun, pun intended, they came out with a total Hall of Famer, the M1 Carbine. Its official name, of course, is U.S. Carbine Caliber .30 M1. It was intended as a light rifle. Again, we talked about why. It was produced by a bunch of manufacturers in this is one of the reasons that the collector market for the M1 carbine has taken off in the last, I don't know, decade, last two decades, because there's so many different varieties. And trying to put those together, make them accurate and true to its original form is a work. It's tough to do. Guys dig it, and I totally understand it. Winchester produced them and soon realized they did not have the production capacity to keep up with demand. So contracts were issued to companies like Saginaw, Underwood, Postal Meter, IBM. How cool would it be to have one with IBM stamp on it? Rock Ola, Inland Division, they produced a lot. This one's an Inland, World War II. It has a bayonet lug on it, so I think we dated this to June of 1943 with a serial number check. And then we had Standard Products, Quality Hardware, Machine. Just some of the companies that produce these guns. And we'll jump right into that. The collectability of an M1 carbine is up there. You know, collectors will go out and they'll say, hey, you know, they're looking for proper code markings on all the components to include the stocks, all the internal components, the barrel. Does it match? Does it make sense? They'll go into the books like I showed you there. And they'll collect all the variants as much as they can afford a lot of them will go a one of each of each of the i believe 10 manufacturers how fun is that so you have a collection of m1 carbines of each of those manufacturers and maybe they'll add to that some of the rarities of the gun collectability that's its first i think calling at this stage in the game of the m1 carbine but like i said at the outset i think also it is just so fun to shoot. I know I say this a lot about a lot of guns, and they are. I mean, most guns are really enjoyable to shoot, but I don't know what it is about an M1 carbine that just really does it for me. I think it might be the balance of power versus low recoil impulse, and it's loud. It just makes it a fun gun to shoot. I realized that back in Hampton, Virginia, in the gravel pit. I mean, back then I was just a little kid, but I could control the gun easily i could hit with it easily and then i'd you know slam in a 30 round mag and off we go to the races bam, 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 bam. it's just really really fun if you have a shooter who doesn't have any experience with other caliber weapons and you want to transition them to a semi-auto gun do so wisely by the way don't turn them on to a 44 magnum or something stupid like that and make them afraid of the gun you might this would be a perfect example it's small, it's diminutive in its dimensions, it has a short length of pull, it's low recoil, it's very non-intimidating for anyone. You know, a female shooter has no experience, great gun. Kids, great gun. 
recreational philosophy of use. How about a, a nice already intro to this? It was actually designed as a backup oh, rifle yeah. for the troops. I'm talking second line troops. Uh, and in that philosophy of use, I think it served well when you consider or take into account the limitations of its caliber, which are substantial. Range and hitting power, we'll hit that again. Under firepower talking point, not right now. But again, the mortar crews, engineers, all those dudes, they loved it. And there's also a philosophy of use here, paratroopers gun. You guys already know the M1 Garands were so heavy, you know, when they jumped with those canvas sheaths, they snapped. A lot of them did, so they landed gunless. I think the dudes that were carrying M1 carbines kept their guns because they're so light. There was a paratrooper-only version. Most viewers, I think, will be familiar with that one. The M1A1 with a folding wire stock, the pistol grip. I have lots of memories with that gun, too. I had friends that owned those, and I've seen over the years... Ruger 1022 conversions, which mimic that appearance, that were extremely popular in the 1980s, because everyone wanted to shoot the 22 more affordable. Yes, even back then, but have the looks of that really cool paratrooper look. We're talking all types of second kind of cool. That it connects to you, soul to soul. You know what I'm saying? Philosophy of use. How about primary combat arm? Um, no. That's what I would say. And that's what I meant in the introduction about make your philosophy of use realistic. Uh, there's just so many better options for you to defend home and family than M1 Carby. Now, don't get me wrong. You can do it. I mean, some guys who's chosen, who've chosen the M1 Carby might get excited. But, dude, I mean, I'd much rather be running this right here. You know, your choice of AR-15 would dominate it. I mean, this is a gun that can range out to 300 yards. I can change bullet weights. It has a much higher velocity. Better killing effectiveness. Uh, you know, as far as ergonomics, things you can change. Barrels, grips, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff, which are lacking in, a, of course, an older World War II designed firearm. Now, a lot of people have defended themselves with M1 carbine. Totally. Yeah, it's famous in some circles, law enforcement circles, by nice. having done just that. I'm trying to remember back, there was a dude, I think a long time ago, John Singer, he's like a polygamist or something. I, I remember a picture of him, I think he had an M1 carbine slung over his back, and law enforcement never, I don't know, took his compound or something. I might be remembering that wrong, but that visual image back in the 80s of him carrying his M1 carbine, I was like, hey dude, good gun choice. <laughs> I wouldn't say that now for having more combat effectiveness. Get it? And again, in firepower, we're going to hit it. Innovation and design. Well, we could spend, a, I don't know, an hour and a half on this, but it's boring. <laughs> Suffice it to say, it's a short stroke piston design that was really, in my opinion, designed to look and operate like an M1 Grand with the rotating bolt design which was initially a flat top bolt and then I believe it converted into a round top bolt and I think most of the reproductions are kind of well they go all over the map there's so many reproductions we'll talk about that under value of different incarnations of the M1 carving so it operated just like a grand which is in my opinion an awesome thing it's simple easy and amazingly, like I've said in the Mini 14 reviews, like I said in the M1 Garand reviews, that you would think with all this open that you would have issues, you know, getting sand, mud, water in there. Not so much. It's just a reliable design, even in what a lot of people consider the underpowered 30 carbine. We could talk about the differences in stock wood, the high wood versus the low wood, handguard changes. Six million of these, by the way, were produced. I think that's the number one, or the top produced U.S. small arm of World War II. And then all the different variations as well. We talked about the M1A1, and of course, later on came the M1A2, the M1A3, the M2, the M3, night vision equipped M1 carbines, which I guess they were cutting edge back then, but 
I'm not sure they had a lot of range. Probably around 70 to 100 yards with the night vision ones. Innovation design. That's, dude, I think that's all I'm going to say on <laughs> Again, Carbine Williams was not the key dude who did it. Watch that movie, though. It's still a fun movie to watch. Weight balance and feel of M1 Carbine. And this might be a good place to say this is I'm reviewing a, a World War II, I should say, era M1 Carbine. But this review will apply to any M1 Carbine as long as it's a quality produced gun. They're all going to follow that same svelte portability. 5 pounds, 10 ounces, more or less. Very short length of pull, which is good for some people. Maybe not so much for others. But it makes it awesomely portable. I think a realistic competitor against this would be a good PCC like the kel Sub-2000. That would be a realistic competitor against this. Or any other PCC. But you, you'd have to really look at the ballistics between a pistol caliber and then the 30 carbine. You might find the 30 carbine dominates it. Albeit in an FMJ loading. Versus those pistol ones, you can get in jacket to hollow point some more effective rounds. Feel is fast. It's very fast handling. It's easy to hold up for extended periods of time. Mrs. Nut and Fancy was one of my crew members helping me test this. And throughout the video, here and there, you will see Mrs. Nut and Fancy with her tiny 100 pound frame shooting the M1 carbine. And she loves this gun. Going back to philosophy of use, it might be a great women's gun. And going back to combat arm, and I'm glad I remember this. And I've talked about this with some pistol reviews. If the person has difficulty hitting and feeling confident with a higher, I don't know, more powerful firearm, you know, rifle, carbine, shotgun, an M1 carbine might be great. I'd rather have my wife hitting with a 30 carbine than shooting a, you know, an AR-15 and she can't hit crap. Which, honestly, in my opinion, I would be. Hard to believe because AR-15 is so soft shooting, in my opinion. But some people get freaked out about it. I've seen it. You know, a little bit more blast recoil. A lot of shooting is mental in your head with a shooter. If they're not confident, then it will be translated into poor trigger control, poor breathing control. They can't hit the target. What good is it? 30 carbine, because it's so light, portable, fast into action, easy to hold, comfortable, and really generally unintimidating. Great choice. Which takes us to ergonomics. This one here, again, is a uh, Inland Division one. Which is, you can see it on the barrel here. Which is very faint. And it's stamped Inland Division General, I'm sorry, Inland Division General Motors right here. This one has an awesome trigger on it. 6.5 pounds is what it pulls on my electronic Lyman scale, and it's just fabulous. Imagine that, though. I mean, it's been shot, more or less, since 1943 or so. Been in action, 1943 or so. When I say in action, I'm just saying, who knows what it, where it's been. I mean, if guns could talk, it would be a fascinating story, right? Most of these, by the way, have experienced, I'm talking World War II, maybe even Korea era, Korean era M1 carbines have experienced arsenal rebuild programs at least once, maybe multiple times. Going back to collectability is restoring it to the way it originally left the factory. It's a lot of work, but it's kind of cool if you can do it. So I love the trigger on this. One thing, going back to design, that I don't like on this particular rifle, which, by the way, TMP purchased off of Gunbroker, is the seller misrepresented it a bit to be honest, and there is some you know, substantial corrosion and pitting in this barrel that he did not talk about. So we get this gun, I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, that wood looks awesome, exactly as he talked about. Cross can cannon cartouche there on the stock. This is a reproduction sling, it did not come with it. It's got the late production sliding sight on it. That used to be an L sight. This one, I believe, is superior to it. You know, it, it had, I think, a pre period correct blued 15 round magazine. I don't know if that's like the original mag or not. Rotating safety selector. Forgot to mention that in safety and design. It used to be a push button, but guys were mistaking it for the magazine release, so they go to push their magazine. I'm sorry, 
I confused it. Their safety on, they drop their max. So now it's a rotating selector, which is a little bit confusing. You would think that would be fire, but no, when it's inside the trigger guard, that's fire. Barrel band looked good. The bayonet band, which came into play during the Korean War, not World War II. Like late 1944, I think, when the bayonets were, you know, the M3 was proposed to be put on the M1 carbine. On the short carbine, who cares? <laughs> but collectors care. In the Korean War, they were used, though. But I liked it. I liked the later production M1 carbines myself, personally. And we were stoked when we got this until we looked in the barrel. That's where I'm going. Heavy pitting, and I was, like, so bummed. Pissed, actually, that that wasn't told. Price, I think, was about $7.15 for this gun. Which, for an inland division, I think, overall, great condition M1 carbine. It's fair. That's going to be your ballpark jumping ahead to, to value. We'll talk about an accuracy how this thing shot here in a little bit. And we'll talk about some surprises that happened. That's ergonomics as much as I can remember. I probably forgot some crap. How about firepower? Well, this magazine on the table is not a World War II magazine, obviously, because 15-round sticks is what they used. I think the 30-rounders came into vogue with the M2, M3 versions which were the select fire ones. The M2 was the first select fire one, and man, what a rush that would have been. I've never shot an M2. Basically, it's a full auto capable, obviously, M1 carving. But 30 round magazines came into play. This one we got from Brownells, and here's your information in case you're interested, if it's still out there. Uh, I checked the other night, and they were back ordered, but it's Enter Arms Produced, and there's your skew on it. 30 round mag, and I'll tell you, it was Aces. In testing I mean we didn't put like thousands around through it we can't afford that but what we shot I saw no jams whatsoever you might not be so lucky with a gun show 30 rounder and there's all types of magazines for 30 carbines imagine that they've been around since World War II but I think if you get a quality magazine either the 15 round or the 30 round you'll be happy and they're not going to break the bank which you can't say about every gun right there's some guns out there that are outrageous in the expense department when you go and get your 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 magazines but let's talk a little bit about the cartridge though it's going to spit out around i'll say 1900 feet per second 110 grain fmj again stack that up against a pcc compare your ballistics we're talking like a serious defensive not recreational philosophy of use and you know decide for yourself I think if you get a PCC in 10 millimeter, I don't know, man. I'd probably pick that. It, and that's out of an 18-inch barrel. Initially, I think the government GI specifications wanted this light rifle to shoot out to 300 yards. There's no way I'd be shooting a 300 a, a, a M1 carving to 300 myself and expect effective effectiveness. I just no, no thanks. I say a 223 for me is a 300-yard gun. It's a freaking pea shooter. M1 carbine even more. But that being said, it's controllable, portable. You're going to have it when other guns you may not have. And it still is much easier to shoot accurately and hits harder than most pistols of the era. Overall, it's highly underpowered. In fact, there were some complaints from GIs to that effect. Maybe not so much in World War II. I think I read some from the Pacific campaign. They weren't real happy about the Japanese island, Pacific Island conflict. Uh, and I think I have a quote with one. Here we go. A lot, lot felt that it lacked range, stopping power, and accuracy. This dude says, this is an excellent quote. A young U.S. Army sergeant went up a small ravine to relieve himself carrying his M1 carbine. He ran into a short husky Jap infantryman coming down the same canyon. The Jap had a rifle with a bayonet. They were about 30, year, 30 yards or so apart when the Jap charged. The sergeant unlimbered his carbine from his quick draw, inverted his quick draw inverted carrying position. We've all seen that. It took him nine shots to send the Jap to, onto his ancestors. The sergeant never carried the carbine in combat again because he had completely lost faith faith in its ability to stop a hostile. Wow. Uh, I, can't I can here. see I that. I watched those Hollywood movies of guys charging, you know, like the beach with an M1 carbine, and knowing what I know, 
and having the rounds under my belt with an M1 Garand, uh, I wouldn't want wanted to have carried this gun on a beach assault. There's no way because of the the underpowered nature of the, the caliber. The the M1 Grand just dominates at 30 out six. I think most guys get that, but a lot of guys did it, and I don't really know if it's over overrepresented in the movies we've watched because it is kind of a sexy firearm. Um, again, Band of Brothers. Saving Private Ryan, Sizemore was rocking, I believe, an M1 carbine a lot. Total. What was it? And Saving Private Ryan, or I, as I call it, SPR. I don't know. But myself, I would have taken, I would have erred to the side of firepower in the equation and packed the 10 and a half pound Grand into combat and know that when I hit one dude, he's going down and have the range. 300 yards of the Grand, no problem. 500 yards, Normandy doable. M1 carving, not so much. So when we talk about firepower, the, the rounds count is excellent. 30 rounders, 15 rounders, they're reliable, that's all good. But the troops were saying, dude, if you want this to be effective, aim for the head. Especially in Korea, there were a lot of complaints in Korea, the Korean conflict, where they said, hey, it's not stopping the Chinese. I mean, they're wearing their insulated clothing, they call them Chinese underwear. Guys were taking hits. They weren't going down. They weren't pissed. And they had reliability problems with the M1 carbine. The first I read, actually, due oh, to the cold right. weather. Yep. The recoil impulse of the cartridges nine. of the day wasn't enough. There was, was the some problems with the recoil center. springs. I think they got it worked out. I think it was five something. In the Korean oh, conflict, cool. the M1 carbine kind of lost some cool points. That's fun. Is the bottom line. Due to the, again, the weakness of the today. cartridge. Yeah. Incidentally, these mags are about what I, I said they're cheap but I'm talking if you get like used ones the new ones are gonna be more I'd say around 30 Fulton Armory has them for around twenty dollars for the 15 round mags I'm not sure what the country of origin is I bet you it's China let's see on this one oh let's see made in oh Taiwan dude there you go Taiwan for that enter ordinance but again if the quality levels awesome eh. Materials and quality. What you need to decide if you want an M1 carbine is, do I want to go with a reproduction one, a commercial produced, or do I want to spend the time and research to get this one? A World War II, maybe Korean era M1 carbine, which by the way, had a very long service life. 1942 to 1973, the gun cost 45 freaking dollars in World War II for the government to buy. That's a lot of guns, six million out there. My recommendation is you go for a gun full of soul, like this, combat proven soul. Not to say there's not some great reproduction M1 carbines out there, even on the used market, and I'll just spit out a couple brands. Car Arms owns, uh, what is it, Auto Ordnance, and they're producing a really nice one, high quality. So the Auto Ordnance one is going to run about, I think, like eleven to twelve hundred dollars. I bounced around into go gun brokers, saw them there. They've been oh, producing that one since two thousand five, and that's SKU number uh, Alpha Oscar Mike one three zero, Alpha Oscar Mike one five zero. Both have walnut stocks. They're excellent, from what I understand. They did have some quality issues early on. I think they've ironed them out. Right Iver there. Johnson ones were produced for a long Second time. Drop. Those were run about $500. They had a D-Day version. That's cool. Fulton is making some really good ones. They're using new barrels, probably Criterion brand barrels. Uh, World War II re receivers that have been refinished and new production walnut stocks. I'm talking the Fulton Armories and one uh, carbines. Cool. Rock Stone. Island, Howa, Springfield, yeah, Armory, band. Universal again are just a couple other brands that are produced. Through. I would say go for a I'm World sure War II one and it. spend oh, the yeah. time, Very effort to find high. one that you're happy with totally. on the secondary market, whether it's online, in person, on and life. just kind of go in armed with some knowledge. And we did research before we bought. We wanted to make sure it was pretty much parts correct. From what we can ascertain on this gun, it is. You know, did a collector put all these together? Who knows? I'm not that particular because I'm not an M1 carbine collector. To me, it turns me on. It's a second kind of cool thing, and that's what you need to determine. I mean, when I pick up this gun, you know, it's it does it for me. Like I said, very happy with it. 
So that's what you need to decide. If we talk about materials and quality, if you get one of these war era M1 carvings, I think you're going to be elated with it. Because that was the era, like I said in my M1 Grand review, when at least, I don't know, until the dark days of World War II, they still made quality firearms. You know, everything is just to a T on it. Now, granted, on some examples, they're going to be rough or hewn because of the expediency of, expediency of wartime. I get it. You'll decide, you know, what's most important to you. Do you want, like, a Type 1, Type 2 trigger? What kind of barrel? The slight variances which give the gun character. I won't talk about that. You decide. But materials and quality are excellent, as evidenced by me bringing to table in 2014 a gun from 1943. Still here. Reliability and durability. We mentioned that already. I would say overall in World War II, from what I know, and my knowledge is imperfect. I mean, I don't make a life of researching the M1 carving. Okay, right it, it was excellent. It, per, it was very reliable in both the Pacific campaign and the ETO. We already talked about Korea. We were running a Gila 110s out of this. And by the way, M1 carbine ammo is expensive and it's hard to find. The only upside is when you buy them, they come in 50 round packs, usually. That is a limitation of the gun. You want to use it as a recreational POU? Dude. Woo. Go talk to grandma. Get some Christmas money because ammo is expensive. There, was, there were complaints about the M2, the full auto version, select fire version of the M1 carbine being less reliable. Imagine that. You know, when they put this gun together, I think it was designed as a semi-automatic firearm. And that way, it worked great. On to accuracy. I talked to you guys about the barrel, right? It is corroded. I don't really have a shot of the interior of it. Take my word for it. What amazed me on this gun is that even though it had that barrel, it shot perfectly. I mean, it just blew my mind. Here's come, here comes some paper. This is 50 yards with a gun on the table. The Aguila round. And I was standing with a Cabela's tripod. If I can find the footage, I'll roll it in somewhere. 50 yards with iron sights. So that's a three round group shot by me. I don't know, two and a half inches. With iron sights, I'll take that. Here's 25 yards, same gun. This is a... Uh, 2012, I told you we've been testing this a while. Handheld off the bench, still shooting a Gila. Sorry, that's the only round we had. Great accuracy to me. I'm digging it. Here's another one. I even wrote here, corroded barrel too. 25 yards, irons, handheld off the bench. April 2012. Bam. Happy with that. Oh, and I forgot to tell you this. I did shoot more than one sample for this review. Uh, Impact guns going all the back, way back to 2011. So I guess this is a three-year review. This is actually Derek, the manager of the gun, uh, gun store at the time. He shot this, and that's a good group. I mean, he's shooting right, but the grouping is good. Another good group. And this is uh, distance 25 yards. That was good. And this is me. You can see on that particular gun, and I forget what it was. I think it was a Rockola M1 carbine. Shooting to the right, high right. Good group there. That was shooting Remington FMJ. So I did shoot a little bit of some other rounds. Uh, I would say from that experience shooting this gun. Oh, and also we shot the crap out of steel targets. Imagine that. Nothing fancy project shooting steel from actiontarget.com. And man, that was fun the pistol rack was amazing with m1 carbine i mean just schwack 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 you can do a close range the low power in that uh, in that situation has the advantage of i can shoot pistol plates reset it shoot again next thing you know you've shot 300 rounds guilty as charged did it way fun and then shooting longer ranges both this is nothing fancy the crew members that helped me test this gun all making hits easy out to 75 yards, 50 yards on those smaller round plates. I would say the accuracy is better than depicted by most circles. You want the 30? The Judging 30 from that small data point. Cool the is cool, but the shocked are... that this gun shoots so good without corroded barrel. I had heard that, that hey, sometimes you can't look at a barrel and say, hey, this is going to shoot bad. Shoot it, and you may be amazed. 
Color me amazed, dude. The accuracy is excellent. Four groove, right hand twist again. I, I love the accuracy though. Again, it's going to beat the pistol and submachine gun for that matter in most situations. Because it's more comfortable to shoot. I much prefer, by the way, this rear sight. The sliding one, micrometer adjustable for windage and elevation. It's just sick. Love that sight. Field strip, ain't gonna talk about. Look it up online if you're interested. You take the barrel band off, the hand guard off. It's pretty simple. There's a couple photos when I did it. Got into the gun, I was checking some markings on the parts, lubricated appropriately wherever there was a shiny surface. I think I just used Shooter's Choice grease on that and it worked fine. And also when I did it, I wanted to look at the condition of the recoil spring because you want to change that once in a while. Otherwise, you may have reliability issues. It is a key operating component of the rifle. Imagine that. In fact, you'll see here, and I ordered this, I believe, from Brownells as well. Here is a Wolf Spring Kit for maintenance purposes. To do that, there's your SKU number for the M1 carbine. 30 caliber. Rifle service pack is what they call that. And that will take us to accessories. You've seen a couple on the table. You want a lot of mags. My recommendation is eight magazines per gun. Whatever semi-automatic carbine or rifle you have, you should have eight magazines for the life of the rifle. However you need to get them, wherever you need to store them, you know, whatever happens to the laws, whatever, you need your magazines, keep them, hide them as necessary. Definitely get a sling. You can order those off Amazon, and that's what I did with this one, and it's good. I think color-wise, it's period correct. Construction-wise, who knows? Close enough for me. I'm happy with it. You could buy actual GI slings if you want. They're going to be more money, especially in really good condition. This one comes with an oiler bottle, which will fit in the slot of the stock. That was changed over the life of the rifle. There's your steel butt plate, by the way. I don't really do a like a you know point by point ergonomic talk about the M1 carbine because it's so well known. Slim fore end, great trigger. The trigger guard's tiny. Barrel band. Retention, uh, you know, you guys already know. There is a jungle clip, and that is still available reproduction wise about how you can clip two 30 ma round mags together up and down. Yeah, you could do that. Uh, M4 bayonet, M8 Alpha 1, or whatever bayonet you want to fit. I like having M1 carbine with a bayonet lug on it. I think it looks cool. I know it's a later production feature that it's not World War II authentic. I don't care. I like it. Protected front sight. Forgot to show you that. The sight picture on this gun is, it's really open. I mean, the aperture is large, as you can imagine, like a lot of World War II firearms. But the accuracy does not suffer, and it's that standard, wonderful GI aperture that I've always raved about. You can get a bandolier clip, I'm sorry, bandolier kit with stripper clips in it if that's how you want to charge your magazines. I wouldn't waste my time for a second, kind of cool. Eh. The M3 flash hider is available if you want to mimic the M3. Camus case, paratrooper case are available. Scope mounts, usually aftermarket. They're not generally, I think, following GI design. I may be wrong on that. Different rear sights if you want. KFS Industries has one for like 25 bucks, which will look like this one, but it's going to be, I, I, I'm sorry, it's going to be lower quality would be my, my guess because this, again, this is a World War II era sight that's just super high quality. Standing the test of time. Most of the aftermarket sights that I see for World War II era firearms are of inferior quality compared to this. And then I showed you that tune-up kit. Is it worth the money you're going to spend? Uh, I would say absolutely it is if you get a specimen like this. I lucked out with that barrel. I've talked about that. But everything else about this gun, for me, for our family, turns us on. My son Tactical Doodle loves this gun. I mean, this is a gun there. This is an, another one of those heirloom firearms that the boys are going to be fighting over. Incidentally, join the NRA. Give generously to the NRA ILA so you can keep your M1 carbine because they will come after it. If you are a gun owner, you are a political activist. I've said that before. I will never back off from that position. You should join the NRA. Gun owners of America, too, and be politically active because they will come after this gun. Yes, even a World War II era collectible gun, they don't care. They want you to get rid of all 
your guns. I talked about some competitive offerings. There's a lot out there. The M1 carbines of various makes and models. You're just going to have to look at the quality and see if it does it for you. Do some research on a specific brand. Again, I recommend a World War II specimen if you can find it. Once upon a time, you could get this gun from CMP. Those days, I'm sorry, are long gone. And that happened some time ago when the collector interest finally picked up on the M1 carbine. No matter, they're still out there. If you're looking and you look at the gun shelves, your used gun racks, wherever you live, you may be surprised what you find there. Track record. Uh, how about this? Pretty awesome. You know, millions produced. I think even now the Israeli police are still rocking M1 carbines. They love them. I think a cool collector one would be that one that's marked unquality. It was actually a, it was like a mix match of Underwood quality. I'm sorry, Underwood and quality hardware. But they, they, they stamped it on the receiver. I think unquality. That would be a cool collectible. I'm sure someone watched this video probably has one. Lucky devil. Yes, it's underpowered. Be realistic in your expectations of the cartridge. 300 yards, no way. 200, yeah, you can hit with it, but man, this thing just drops like a rock. It's just not going that fast. The ogive of the bullet isn't ballistically efficient. Has a low BC, no. How about a 100 yard gun and in? That's what I would consider. 50 yards, absolutely. CQB, CQB gun, even now, absolutely. It will do anything a PCC will do, sometimes even better. The Marine Raiders absolutely love this gun. Talking about track record in the Pacific Island War. They loved it. Highly recommended. Seriously, one of my all-time favorite semi-automatic recreational firearms. Centerfire or Rimfire. The M1 Carbine. The World War II version. Still out there. Will connect to your soul. They're battle-proven. They're Hollywood-proven. And a lot of cool movies I highly recommend it. That is an advanced review.